Welcome to the Crohn's Disease Pathophysiology presentation. I'd like to begin with a quick review of intestinal anatomy. If you'll recall, the four main layers of the intestine from the outside in is the serosa, then the muscularis externa, then the submucosa, and then the mucosa layer, which contains the surface epithelium. The hollow part of the intestine is called the lumen. The mucosa layer is typically on the front lines of Crohn's disease, and it's typically in the mucosa layer that Crohn's disease begins. I want to zoom in a bit closer here and show you some important structures to bear in mind as this presentation progresses. These structures are the villi, which consists of a single layer of epithelial cells. On each villus are microvilli, also known as the brush border. In between the villi is the intestinal crypt, which at the base contains specialized stem cells responsible for the production of other stem cells and special cells called transit amplifying cells, which move up along the villus and differentiate into epithelial cells. Crohn's disease often begins with crypt inflammation and abscesses, which then turn into ulcers. Since the intestinal crypts are affected, this disrupts the work of the stem cells. Because the inflammatory response doesn't turn off, the ulcers get worse and grow bigger. Inflammation then spreads through the full thickness of the intestine. This is called transmural inflammation. Transmural spread of inflammation leads to swollen lymph vessels and lymph nodes and a thickening of the bowel wall and mesentery. Extensive inflammation may result in hypertrophy of the muscularis mucosa and scar tissue formation, which can lead to bowel obstruction. Abscesses and fistulas are often seen. Abscesses are simply pus-filled sacs, and fistulas are areas where the intestine <clears throat> has an opening from the inside to the outside uh, all the way to the uh, abdominal cavity, sometimes to other organs or structures within the abdominal cavity. Segments of bowel of diseased bowel abruptly end and healthy tissue abruptly begins in Crohn's disease. These are called skip areas, and this is why it's given the name regional enteritis. So mucosal inflammation leads to the presence of neutrophils and mononuclear cells uh, into the epithelium, which then enter the crypts, causing inflammation in the crypts. And again, this is called cryptitis. Uh, this inflammation in the crypts can lead to crypt abscesses. Granulomas can also enter into the crypts during this inflammatory response. The chronic nature of inflammatory response causes the villi to atrophy. It also causes changes in the crypts, which can lead to tissue metaplasia. Metaplasia is the transformation of one kind of tissue into another undesirable tissue, which then, uh, which is what happens typically in cancer formation. This causes an increased risk of cancer in the areas of diseased tissue for folks with Crohn's disease. So I want to end this presentation with a couple of images which show some of the changes that occur in Crohn's disease pathophysiology. The first image shows a comparison of normal ileum with a Crohn's diseased ileum. As you can see, it contains what's called cobblestone appearance, which is a hallmark sign of Crohn's disease. This cobblestone appearance is from the fissures and ulcers, which form separate islands of mucosa, giving it a cobblestone appearance. You can also see in this picture a thickening of the wall and an area here depicting an obstruction due to scar tissue formation and intestinal wall thickening. Finally, I want to show you an image from Johns Hopkins University that displays Crohn's disease on a histology level. As you can see, there is clearly a difference in the appearance. In normal intestine, you can clearly see the villi and crypts. On the Crohn's disease histology slide, however, you can see that there's a thickening of the wall and the crypts and villi are deformed. Also, what you can't really see in this picture is that the villi that are there have lost their microvilli brush border. 
These changes make it difficult, if not impossible, for the diseased tissue to absorb nutrients. This causes nutritional deficiencies, especially in vitamins D and B12.